Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On a weekly basis, the South African Bar Association hosts an esteemed speaker to deal with a legal topic. This is an initiative aimed at making an essential contribution to developing the skill set of all and any persons who represent the South African public in our courts. It is my honor and privilege to introduce today's speaker. Our speaker today is Advocate Arnaz Matlala. By way of providing a brief background of Arnaz, he started working at the trade union official. Thereafter, he joined City Power Johannesburg as an ER manager and later BHP Bulletin. Subsequently, he has joined the CCMA as a level A commissioner and later appointed as a senior commissioner and a convening senior commissioner for the East Rand. In November 2018, he joined UNISA as a director of labor relations. Thereafter, Arnaus has joined the bar. Arnaus shall be addressing us on the topic titled Managing CCMA Processes and How to Resolve CCMA-Related Concerns. In terms of housekeeping, these sessions are recorded and appeal to participants to ensure that your microphones are muted and that your video cameras are switched off. Should a participant have a question, simply raise your hand. Alternatively, type your question within the chat box using the Microsoft Teams platform and such questions shall be posed to Arnaz. During the question and answer session, a humble request is made to restrict questions to the speaker relative to, to the topic under, the, under discussion and only post such question when called upon. Without any further ado, I now hand it over to Arnaz. Over to you, Arnaz. Thank you very much, uh, AJ, for this opportunity. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge... Hey, I'm just going to interrupt you. Please forgive me. Your your camera is switched off. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, AJ. I was saying that firstly, I would like to acknowledge some of my former CMA colleagues who have also joined the bar. Um, some of them, they came before me. Shalele Moloti SC, I acknowledge um, Dira Matate, as well as, uh, I, I think I've seen Likau, and as well as the members of the South African uh, Bar Association. Um, what I will do here, uh, in regard to the members of the, of the South African Bar Association, I must really also acknowledge uh, Badford. He's also a former uh, CCMA commissioner. Okay, let me share. Let me share here. Okay. The presentation that that I will be doing here. Just hold on a sec, uh, AJ. I have uh, I have shared it for you if you if you like, or would you like to share it by yourself? Uh, you you muted you muted now, sorry, Amas. Arnaz, you, you muted, you muted now. Thank you, AJ. What we'll be dealing with today is that we are dealing with uh, how to manage CCMA processes. And uh, if you've got any concerns that you have when you are at the CCMA, um, how to resolve uh, those uh, re related uh, concerns. Um, the, the issues that we will deal with, uh, AJ, the next slide, uh, just as a summary of what we'll be dealing with is what is the role of the CCMA, and that is broadly, and um, which parties can refer matters to the CCMA, the next issue we'll be dealing with, uh, and um, which matters are typically referred uh, to the CCMA. The next matter is um, when is legal representation allowed? This is a, a concern, obviously, for people who are attending this uh, seminar today. And um, the next is how to bring an application, uh, whatever process that you may be interested in. And there is a concern that of perceptions of parties being bullied uh, by commissioners to settle cases at the CCMA. How do we deal with that? when you are uh, representing a party and you feel that you are being bullied or your client is being bullied to settle a dispute. 
Then we'll also deal with the cost orders at the arbitration. And um, then the last two will be uh, if there are any complaints arising, how do you deal with uh, those complaints arising in, um, in or during processes? Thanks, AJ. Firstly, the, the role of the CCMA is to resolve uh, labor disputes uh, through conciliation and uh, arbitration. So that is the primary role of the CCMA briefly, is, is to deal with how to deal with disputes in conciliation and arbitration. Um, there are various ways that the CCMA deals with that, uh, conciliation, mediation, arbitration, various interventions that are, are dealt with, uh, as well as facilitations. Thanks, AJ. Who can refer matters to the CCMA? Um, employees on their own can refer matters to the CCMA. Trade unions on their own can refer cases to the CCMA. They can refer cases to the CCMA on behalf of employees and as well as um, on their own as trade unions. There are, other, there, are, there are matters where a trade union on its own can refer a case to the CCMA. Um, there are also limited instances where an um, employer may refer a matter to the CCMA. For example, uh, this is very limited instances, and one instance that I can recall uh, offhand is in regard to Section 189A, capital letter A, cases, that is um, mass retrenchments. Um, that's where some, in, in, in certain instances, the union may refer a matter, and in certain instances, the employer uh, themselves um, may refer such a matter to, to the CCMA. Okay. Matters that are typically, typically referred to the CCMA are unfair dismissals. This will constitute about 86% of cases that the CCMA deals with. Um, then, then the rest is a tiny percentage of uh, cases that may be referred to the CCMA. Unfair labor practice, um, unfair discrimination, BCA entitlement disputes and uh, collective bargaining related disputes. Collective bargaining dis related disputes will be matters of mutual interest, uh, especially where trade unions uh, and, and, and employers are involved. In fact, that's where trade unions and employers are involved. Uh, those are will be and related to wages and other conditions of service. That those are the typical matters that uh, the CCMA will deal with. Now, as a of interest to people who are attending this, is which matters uh, is legal representation allowed? Let's start first by saying um, one process where legal representation is not allowed is at a conciliation proceedings. Um, I will later deal with um, as to an event in what instances can a legal representative be allowed in a process. Now, to guide legal representatives, attorneys, and advocates as to, as to when do you know whether you can represent or not, that is governed by Rule 25 of the CCMA rules. It will help you to clarify which matters you can or you cannot be able to represent a client. Now, if a dispute is about the fairness of a dispute, of a dismissal, and it relates, it pertains to conduct or capacity, legal representation is not automatically allowed. That does not necessarily mean that it, it's, it's, it will not be allowed, for, for instance, as in conciliation, but it may be that instances where legal representation may be allowed, and then it, it, it depends on certain considerations uh, by by a commissioner. Let's see what those considerations the commissioner will have a look at. Uh, and the commissioner will have a, a, a look at what is the, or to grant, to grant a legal representat representation. A commissioner will look at as the nature of questions raised in that dispute, whether it's a complex matter 
whether it's of public interest, and whether the comparative ability of parties um, at, at any given point. For instance, if if the employer is represented by a very experienced HR manager, ER manager, the commissioner and the, the employee is not well versed in ER or in labor law, the com a commissioner may in those instances allow legal, uh, legal representation. Uh, of course, uh, depending on um, application made to, to that commissioner, and I will address that at the, at the later stage. What is of critical importance here is that parties on their own, um, if both parties are legally represented, they may agree, they may give their consent to have legal representation. In many instances, the commissioner will agree that he will grant that that uh, representation if parties agree. Uh, they've consented to that uh, to legal representation. Legal representation. The commissioner will agree. However, please be aware that the commissioner, despite the fact that parties have agreed to legal representation, the commissioner may still say no. Depending on the questions that we have, uh, the considerations that uh, we have dealt with. If the issue is not of public interest, it's not complex, and when you look at the comparative ability abilities of the parties and say that this is both parties can be able to deal with the, with this on their own, and that there are no questions of law raised, the commissioner may still say no um, uh, to legal representation, despite that the parties have agreed to legal representation. Okay. And when is it allowed? One is legal representation allowed. Um, legal, no representation by legal practitioner or candidate attorney shall be allowed in facilitations of large scale retrenchments. Uh, that, that is section 189A. And uh, lay consultants are just not allowed um, into to represent parties at the CCMA. Now, one, one party or some of the parties that may be allowed, uh, uh, automatically allowed to legal to to represent at the CCMA are trade unions, the employees themselves, uh, etc. Which processes uh, is legal representation automatically allowed? There's a whole list there. But as I've already indicated, the, this constitutes a tiny percentage of cases at the CCMA. The majority of cases that uh, the CCMA deals with are unfair dismissals, as well as to a large extent, to some extent, uh, incapacity matters. But this is a whole list of cases. Uh, for instance, uh, 186A, this is unfair, some of the unfair dismissals. Um, one A to F, unfair dismissals. One eighty six two, those are disputes of unfair unfair labor practices. Automatically unfair dismissals. Inquiry by arbitrator. Inquiry by arbitrator. This is a process where the parties can go to the CCMA and say that we don't want to do a disciplinary hearing on our own. We would like the CCMA to do this disciplinary hearing for us. And so the disciplinary hearing is, is disciplinary hearing cum arbitration, because now after the, after the disciplinary hearing, which is dealt with by the CCMA um, and, and is an arbitration, the parties cannot refer the matter back to the CCMA after the, 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 the hearing. All that they can do if is if this um, dispute, if there's unhappiness, they can refer the case to the to for review to the head of the labor court. Dismissals based on operational requirements, other than 189, um, there may be legal representation there. 197 and 197A transfer of business is a going concern and or, or of a contract of employment in circumstances of insolvency. All disputes in relation to Section 198A to C, all those may may have uh, a legal representation may, may, may be allowed. BCEA 73A um, that is failure to pay any amount in terms of uh, national minimum wage, contract of employment, sectoral determination or collective agreement. However, in these instances, there are certain thresholds. To those people who are, I can't recall now what is the threshold. Um, de uh, determining uh, referral, a referral to the CCMA, 
those who are in senior positions, um, 300 and above, 300,000 and above per annum cannot refer, um, cannot have those dealt with at the CCMA. And um, the Employment Equity Act, Section 10, unfair discrimination cases can be, um, legal representation can be allowed in those instances. In conciliation, as I've already alluded, uh, legal representation is not allowed, but you may request as a legal representation attorney, advocate, candidate attorney, or, or people advocate, you may request uh, to, to represent a party in council, especially if you have a mandate to settle. Um, those who are commissioners will tell you that there are instances where they, if they know that this party settles cases and is an attorney or an advocate, they will allow that party to, or if they, they assist in the process, they will allow that attorney or advocate to represent a party at conciliation. Uh, just go back uh, a, a bit. Uh, okay, thank you. A client can be given an opportunity. Uh, this is important for legal representatives to tell their clients that if I'm, I'm not allowed into a process, um, conciliation process, please note that you don't have to take a decision on your own. Consult with me at all instances. So your client, when faced with whatever that is being discussed with the commissioner, can say to the commissioner, commissioner, I hear what you are saying on this and your advice on this. Can I have a discussion with my representative? Now, there are instances where, as because we know as legal representatives that the CCMA doesn't allow for legal representation at conciliation, we say to our clients, you, you can go because we are, not go we are not allowed. My advice is that go, um, so that your client can have somebody that they can be able to consult with, so that whatever decision that, that, that they take, they can be comfortable that they have had your advice as a representative. The other issue is that your presence as a legal representative uh, may prevent this bullying that you are talking about. If, if a commissioner knows that the legal representative is present and, and the client can always go and talk to the to the legal representative then instances of bullying then they, they get seriously minimized in in those instances thanks and um what happens if legal representation is denied um what you can do as a legal representative is that you may request the arbitrator that uh, commissioner i would like to sit in this process arbitration is a it, it, it occurs in an open court so it, it is a public process so you can request to sit there and observe what is happening now the advantage of that is that from time to time when parties take a break then they can be able to go you can be able to go and talk to your client as to how to proceed at any given time uh, point uh, uh, regarding uh, in, in the process of arbitration. Now, I would like to warn uh, legal representatives that when you are there, don't try to communicate in whichever way or form with your client or make certain gestures of whether of approval or disapproval um, of whether it's your client or the other party. Because the other party may say to the commissioner, commissioner, this is what the legal representative is doing, or the commissioner may see what you are doing and you'll definitely be kicked out of the, of the process. Thanks, AJ. Rule 31 of the CCMA rules determines how, on how to bring an application. And the, it does the same way that you bring an application for, for legal representation. However, legal representation can also be made um, on the day of the hearing. You, you can go there 
and ask the commissioner, commissioner um, applying for legal representation. It's, it's, it's advisable to apply for legal representation prior to the matter being heard. And they, those are issues where, or, or matters uh, where, where this rule applies, Rule 31, in terms of how to bring a, an application. It applies to applications for condonation, joint uh, substitution, variation, rescission, and postponements, um, jurisdictional disputes, or other preliminary or interlocutory applications. Uh, as well as it, it's apply for 10 days prior to the date of the hearing on notice to all persons who have interest in, in the application. And now I'm not going, next slide, uh, AJ. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one on how to bring that an application because application on notice is more or less uh, the same, whether it's at the, the Labour Court or Magistrate Court, um, at, at, at the High Court. For instance, the title of the matter, the case number, and, and so on, the relief sort, and, and so on. Next slide. Next one, that is just an application on notice. When you are in the arbitration now, and the commissioner makes certain object, uh, rulings that you object to that you are not happy with make your objections known to the commissioner and make them on record um that commissioner i'm unhappy with this or that ruling that you have made um Please don't tell the commissioner that commissioner, I'm not happy with the ruling that you are making. I'm going to to take you on review. That's that's a right that you have. You honestly don't have to tell the commissioner uh, or threaten the commissioner that you'll take him on 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 review. Um, I think my view is that you are unnecessarily just training the, uh, the relations in in the in the process itself. Now the next issue is that don't say to the don't tell the commissioner that you are going to apply uh, for review of the particular ruling that the commissioner is making. If a commissioner is making a ruling that you don't like, and you say to the you say to the commissioner, commissioner, can we stop the process right here? I want you to take this ruling that you have made um, to the labor court on review. Uh, don't do that. There is a case that I can't recall now. Um, where it's, it, the, it's, it's precedent that you can only do that once the whole matter is, is done and, and finalized. Thank you. Now, a settlement is a very important process at the CCMA. Uh, the uh, certain efficiencies that the CCMA has. And one of the critical efficiencies then that those efficiencies are, are determined by management of the CCMA as well as the governing body of the CCMA. Uh, so it, it's a critical thing for the CCMA to see a high percentage of cases being settled. And the settlement rate at the CCMA uh, for some of those who may not know is 70%. So a commissioner is required to settle about 70% of cases that, that he or she deals with. And this is why then you will see, so is a requirement of the CCMA that you need to settle about 70% of the cases. Um, and, I, and, to, and advantage to the commissioner is that if a case is settled, they don't need to write a, an, an award. Now, for the purposes of the CCMA, commissioners are not paid specifically for an award. So whether you have settled the case or you've done a, in, an award, you don't get paid. Some of the bargaining councils, then they pay, but there's no payment for awards at the CCMA. At the time that the advocate fought was a, was a commissioner at the CCMA, awards were, there was, there was money for, there was, so there was an incentive to pay for awards, not, not anymore. So therefore there's an incentive for commissioners to try to settle as many cases as possible. Because if you don't settle those cases, it means that they have to be arbitrated and um, an award uh, issued. Now, if you see a commissioner pushing, pushing a little bit more than you, you, you would like, you just know that uh, 
uh, commissioners have a certain uh, requirements to meet. However, you have a right to say, Commissioner, we, we hear what you're saying, but we don't agree. We don't want to settle. Um, in fact, as a matter of fact, right from the beginning, you can say, if you, if you don't have a mandate, if you believe that you have a very strong case and you don't want to have it settled, nobody can force you to have a settlement. Unless the settlement is, if the other party, for instance, if it's an employee, if the employee says, no, I withdraw the case. That's fine. That is a settlement as well. If the employer, when they get there and they then have thought about the matter, because now they are at the stage of arbitration and they now want to have thought about it and say, OK, we want to settle um, at 12 months. It's possible. The employer can settle at 12 months. Or even more, there are instances where some of the, of the people who are here who have been commissioners, they will tell you that there are instances where the employer has settled more than what the act prescribes, in well, that is 12 months. And if in instances where the commissioner um, gets into the merits of the case, um, because they, 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 they would like to have it settled, and they get into deep into the merits of the case, they get so deep into the merits of the case and to the extent that they say to the parties, um, whether to the employer, to the employer that they, we think that you are going to lose this case. And here are our, here are our reasons, we believe, I believe as a commissioner that you are going to lose the case. Or they say to the employee the same thing, that we think that you are going to, to lose this case. And for the following reasons, if the employer does that, um, they have gone deep into to the merits and there's nothing wrong with that. They have to recuse themselves. Some commissioners will recuse themselves on their own. Others will have to be asked that commissioner. Thank you for the, your views, your opinions, your advices on this. However, considering the fact that now we're going into the arbitration proper, we request you to recuse yourself because we think there's a big possibility of, of you being biased here. Um, in many senses, commissioners will agree to recuse themselves. Uh, they'll agree to recuse themselves in, su in such processes. And if not, if they don't recuse themselves, then ask for the intervention of a regional senior commissioner or provincial senior commissioner. If both disagree, I mean, the original, the commissioner, the regional senior commissioner, at the time, if they insist that uh, the commissioner must proceed, put your objections on record. Because at the time that you will be conciliating, mediating the matter, you will be off record. Then ask the commissioner that commissioner, um, prior to us starting with the actual arbitration process, I would like to record my objection in regard to the issue of your refusal to Recuse yourself uh, in this process. Now, the, when you are in smaller offices of the CCMA, uh, let's say, for instance, problems that, then all of the, the or secunda, no, the secunda, there are many, there are many commissioners in secunda, smaller towns, where there's one commissioner available on, at, at, at the venue. Try not to get into the merits of the case because you are not going to have to be afforded an opportunity of somebody else being available. If you are in the bigger centers of the CCMA and uh, like Johannesburg, Pretoria, Bloemfontein and so on, um, then you've got the luxury of, or they have the luxury of asking somebody else to take over the matter. But if it's a smaller place where there's one commissioner available, don't don't get too too much into the merit. And you have the right to say, commissioner, we don't I don't want to get too much into the merit uh, of of the case. The commissioner cannot force you to get into the merits of the of the case. AJ. Order for costs at an arbitration. I was a commissioner for, for more than 10, 10 years. However, honestly speaking, I cannot recall more than three times way an order for cost was awarded at the CCMA. 
Maybe maybe even twice. So I really cannot recall. Um, maybe it, it's been done these days, uh, but um, during past time, during my time, during uh, uh, Muloti SC's time, this was very, very rare thing. Uh, that is despite the fact that the law, the LRA has always um, had a provision for order of cost in an arbitration. Um, the commissioner may make uh, such order uh, depending on certain factors, and then those are then that is rule 39 of the CCMA. What is the measure of success, consideration of fairness, any prejudice offers that were made with a view of settling the dispute, whether a party or person who represented that party in the arbitration acted in a frivolous or vexatious manner. Frivolous and vexatious as a, as, a, as a consideration, it has always been there, right from the beginning when the act was enacted in 1996. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, whether the party has conducted, how the party has conducted itself, what effect that cost order may have on continued relationship, if any. If there's any agreement to be concluded between the parties in regard to costs, importance of the issues raised, any other factor that the commissioner may consider. Um, and that is a commissioner may make an award in, of course in favor of a party who appears or is represented in arbitration by a person contemplated in rule 25. Here we are talking about uh, legal representatives, so it may cost orders may, may be made. The commissioner may make the uh, next slide. So the amounts for costs are, are quite limited. They can be limited uh, by the CCMA uh, in terms of the rules, in terms of rule 2039. So those are the limits of how much can be ordered or costs that can be ordered um, in a particular arbitration. Um, 7,000 rents of the first day of arbitration. And if the arbitration goes on longer than a day, um, any additional date will be 4,700 rents, inclusive of VAT. Now, uh, candidate attorneys must be, must can only claim 50% of the amounts that are set of 7,000 rents of, of the, the first day and 4,700. What I'm not sure now is uh, people people advocates. I'm not sure because the LRA doesn't say. I mean, Rule 39 doesn't say anything about them. The last issue that we'll deal with is what what do you do if you have uh, complaints of whatever nature, uh, but not but not rule uh, rulings. If a commissioner makes certain rulings and you are unhappy with such rulings, uh, it's not going to assist you uh, to go and complain to a provincial senior commissioner. But for instance, a, a refusal, refusal to recuse oneself as a commissioner it's one ruling that may be referred to a provincial senior commissioner. So you can always say to the com to the commissioner at the given point that commissioner, I'm not happy with this kind of ruling. If it's a ruling, so just a sec. If it's a ruling that you believe uh, an intervention of somebody senior can be able to deal with you, you say to the commissioner, commissioner, can you please stop the proceedings now? I need to to complain about this and or that to the provincial senior commissioner. Uh, and in the absence of a provincial, in fact, before you speak to the provincial senior commissioner, 
These days, there is what is called the Regional Senior Commissioner, RSC, and uh, then they are um, higher than RSCs is Provincial Senior Commissioner. Um, in certain instances, you may pick up a phone if you know the, the telephone numbers and speak to the National Senior Commissioner of the CCMA, um, the director, depending on the issue. You may even complain to the director of the CCMA, write an email if it, if it helps, uh, or to, if it's an ethical issue, you may even write to the governing body of the CCMA. Depending, honestly speaking, just depending on what kind of issue that you you would like it to be dealt with. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, space, or we didn't have space to to give telephone numbers of those uh, people that you can complain at. But uh, this brings to the end the presentation, and thank you very much. I thank you for that informative address, uh, Arnaz. I have now opened the question, the, uh, the platform for a brief question and answer session. To those that have a question, simply raise your hand, and when your name is called upon, simply allow your mic and or your video to pose your question directly to Arnaz. Alternatively, type your question within the chat box using the Microsoft Teams platform, and such question will be put to Arnaz. I shall initiate the question and answer session. My question around surrounds condemnation. Now we are all familiar with the fact that an employee, an employee has 30 days post termination to apply to the CCMA, failing which the employee needs to apply for condemnation in that regard. Upon our prior discussion, uh, our prior telephonic discussion rather, ra rather, you had mentioned a certain judgment that said something to the effect that if that if that condemnation should be granted in circumstances where the employer's conduct against the employee is done in Malafide. Can you please elaborate on such? I'm going to ask you to repeat the question, um, AJ, but what also in terms of the questions and answers? There are a lot of capable people here, and I deliberately mentioned them when we started with this process so that they can also participate. Um, Molozi SC is here. He was one of our speakers uh, before. Um, Matavo is here um, and uh, Matate. They can all, all assist. But can I request you to repeat the question, please, uh, AJ? Sure. So in summary, upon our, our previous mic, my question is to do with combination. Now, upon our previous telephonic discussion, you mentioned a certain judgment that said something to the effect that if con that is sorry that condemnation should be granted in such circumstances where employers where the employer's conduct against the employee is done in malafide, can you elaborate on such uh, on such judgment, Amos? Okay, colleagues, uh, I'm inviting you to participate um, in the questions and answers. Advocate Matlatle. Yeah, if, if I may uh, announce, I'm speaking on AJ's computer. I'm not sure you can you hear me. It's Bart. Okay. So the, the, there's a decision called Causa and EPSA Bank. And what the Labor Appeal Court said in so far as dealing with condonation is that in all matters pertaining to condonation, the, the interest of justice will always be the most uh, important factor to consider. Um, look, when one deals with condemnation, obviously there are a number of factors that one would, or considerations that one would need to deal with. But what the Labour Appeal Court said in the Causa Absa Bank decision was the interest of justice, because should condemnation not be granted, it would in effect mean that the doors of justice, so to speak, would be closed upon the employee. And in fact, uh, there's an, an, an important note in that judgment where the court said, 
how would the interest of justice be served by denying an employee condemnation? In fact, granting condemnation would serve the very purpose of, of, of promoting the interests of justice as opposed to denying the employee access to, to condemnation. Some of the factors that, that the, the, the court has looked into and, 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 and considered in regard to whether to grant or not grant condemnation is the prospects of success. If the prospects of success, if the court looks at the papers and the application and considers that the prospects of, of success are, are quite good for, for the applicant, then the, there's more likelihood that the, the court grants um, condemnation. The, one of those, obviously, is how, how late the, the, the application for, for condemnation is. Um, but that, as, as um, Advocate Ford has said, that the court also looks into in, in the interest of justice. It looks as to the reasons why is that application late, as, and uh, also the the factor that I, I have mentioned here as to what are the prospects of success in in in, in that matter. Then the court is likely more to grant the condemnation. Thank you so much. You have, uh, you have and the CCMA, of course. Thank you so much. Can I just come in there? Sure. Can I just come in? Uh, and that's Advocate Matlatle. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Advocate Matlatle. Um, I think what um, Advocate Mutlala indicated uh, holds uh, truth. In, no, in most cases, uh, the recent cases that I have read, they indicated the prospects of success and the and the lateness. However, if we have to have a look at uh, all that, basically the court has to take, or the commissioner has to take all the factors into consideration. So cumulatively, you can take it into the end. Uh, imagine a situation where you can say, well, it's in the public interest and blah, blah, blah. But where really you can just see there are no prospects of success and the matter is excessively late. You know, uh, the matter is, um, and the interest of justice, remember, it's a very elusive term. I mean, if a person brings the case six years late, you know, uh, so it's excessively late, it's, ex it's, it's late. And then you look at the interest of justice that, listen, there might not be witnesses and the stuff like that. But I think the guiding principle should be that you look all these factors, take them into account. But as I said, the recent judge, uh, judgments that I have read, they tend to put more emphasis on the factors that Advocate Motlala has indicated, the prospects of success and the lateness. But that does not mean that it's at the expense of others. Uh, the very recent case that I've read, they said, listen, if there are no prospects, uh, what is really the point of going uh, into into so much pain of condoning the matter? Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much for that. Um, sorry, I got a second. My second question is pertaining to, and you briefly touched on that, Amas. This is pertaining to the Section 189 uh, uh, applications, right? Now, I have, um, my submission to you is that during this COVID, especially during this COVID time, employers are using the Section 189 merely as a ruse to dismiss to dismiss employees. Would you would you would you say that, that what would be a comment in that regard? I've I've had experience of of um, employers doing exactly what you are saying. Second, not employers. Let let's be very specific and clear that and not generalize that it's all employers that are doing that. My experience is that they are, I've seen and experienced employ, employers using uh, the cover of COVID-19 to, to retrench. Um, and now they, 
The issue is whether at any given point the employer is able to justify the retrenchment. So if an employee is not happy with the reasons that the employer is giving as to the reasons of the retrenchment or dismissal for operational reasons, the employee can always refer the matter to the CCMA. Uh, depending on the number of people involved there, um, the matter can be referred to the CCMA or the, if the number is quite significant to the labor court. And so the court, the CCMA will look into the real reasons um, whether those are fair or not, because uh, dismissal for operational reasons, they are also subject to a consideration of the fairness, whether it was fair or for the employer to raise as a reason um, retrenchments or not. Thank you so much, Arnaz. Uh, you have you have answered my two questions. There's a there's there's a question from Advocate uh, Part Four. Um, Advocate Moshlala and colleagues. So the circumstances are briefly as follows. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, my sincere apologies for that uh, uh, part. Uh, part. Um, I think we have lost our nose. Can we just can we just have a, a brief? Yes, are you back with us, Arnaz? Yes. Thank you so much. Back to you. Back to you. Uh, back to you, Advocate Ford. So, so the question, Advocate Mushlala, is the following: the circumstances, briefly being, the the commissioner bullied the employee into accepting a settlement agreement, but the settlement agreement is nothing other than what the employee would ordinarily have been entitled to, i.e. leave pay, uh, notice pay, um, and uh, mm. a bonus. So the employee signs that thinking that in doing so it has included a bona fide agreement, but it does not constitute a bona fide agreement for public policy considerations to sign a settlement agreement, which is an entitlement to what you, well, an agreement in respect of what you're already entitled to. How would you advise an employee to deal with, with, with uh, his or her discontent in that regard? Thanks, Advocate for the, the, there was a policy decision, uh, at least when I was there at the CCMA or when we were there with uh, like uh, Advocate Molozi, there was a policy decision that what you have just described now wouldn't be regarded or, or considered as a settlement. That's an entitlement. That's what the employee is entitled to anyway. Now, it's one of those where we would have said that the employee, when unhappy with, with, the, with the outcome, can refer or can, can lodge a complaint with, with the senior commissioner. Uh, I'm not sure now how this is EMA deals with. At the time that we were there, what we would, would do, if satisfied, if the senior commissioner is satisfied that these are the elements that constitute the so-called um, agreement and do we know that this is not an agreement, this is what the employee is entitled to anyway, the matter would still be enrolled for, for arbitration. Um, the, uh, if I recall, this is what used to be to be done. However, I think this is an area of possibility where an employee can be able to successfully review such a an outcome or such a, a, a settlement and take it on review at the labor court. Um, that, that's my thinking, at least now, that if the, the CCMA is not able to resolve this issue, 
um, on its own, considering that this this is not a settlement. Everybody knows that this uh, this is what the employee is entitled to anyway. This is a matter that may be taken on review. And, and just and I, a follow up question before the other speaker, um, uh, uh, as he speaks. What what then would you uh, say in, 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 in as far as the CCMA being complicit? I know complicit is probably a very strong term, but I remember when I was interviewed by the governing body, Nareen Khan had asked me, uh, how do I feel about the the percentage issue pertaining to, to uh, resolving disputes by way of conciliation? And I felt that the threshold set would in all probability result in commissioners resorting to unbecoming tactics in order to try and resolve matters so as to meet the threshold. Um, and, and I'd like to know what your comment in, in, in regards there to is. Can I ask uh, S.C. Molotti to speak before I, I do on, on this matter, please? Good, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, AJ, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Arnas, thank you, my brother. Yes, I think you are correct on, on, on the first issue you raised in respect of during our time, there was that policy decision that uh, any settlements relating to entitlements that are containing a basic conditions of employment, particularly when the dispute related to unfair dismissal dispute and the settlement comprises of entitlements in the BCA, that was not a settlement. And I think the CCMA at that time went at great length to inform the employees uh, by putting notice boards, in fact, even in the hearing rooms themselves, that they should not settle cases in respect of notices, uh, uh, leave, and all of that when they have referred an unfair dismissal dispute. So you are correct, Arnas. In respect of the second question of, of Advocate Ford, Look, I think it's important to, to, to put this thing into a proper perspective, and which is that the CCMA at first is a, a believes in mediation, meaning that we the CCMA at, at a time when we were there on us, we put mediation before arbitration, meaning that we wanted the parties to settle their disputes before they proceed to arbitration. Because we're always of the view that in settling uh, cases in mediation or conciliation, the parties, you determine the outcome rather than the arbitrator sitting there making a decision which will be binding to the parties. So because of that policy view, uh, which I hope is still the case, then the CCMA then in order to uh, galvanize and incentivize the parties to resolve the, the cases, decided to put the settlement rate of the commissioners at the 70%. And really, it is not really about uh, commissioners forcing the parties to settle. It's really about making sure that we live in terms of the LRA objectives, which is a speedy resolution of labor disputes. And I think part of trying to resolve cases in conciliation is really that, that you want parties to resolve cases in conciliation rather than going through a formal arbitration process, which in some instances can be very difficult process, particularly for applicants who are unrepresented and perhaps at some stage also uneducated. So that was the policy uh, rationale behind the 70%. But also, the governing body, even during our time, Arnas, has always been, although they expect commissioners to reach 70% settlement rate, but they were always amenable to commissioners who were just below 70%, and also commissioners who were really not uh, mediators, but mostly arbitrators, who you'll find that such commissioners, then their settlement rates will be sitting at about 50% and so. And the governing body really never really went into details or, or take issue with people who do not reach 70% settlement rate. But I think, I mean, speaking for myself, and I'm sure Anas will bear me out here, as senior commissioners at that time, part of our responsibilities was to guide and assist who are not really reaching the target of 
And we are further mindful of the fact that those commissioners should not force parties to settle. And hence, the, the, the CCMA at that time had an open-door policy of uh, uh, complainants coming directly to the senior commissioner's office if they were unhappy with the process to complain about the outcome. And such interventions will be done to make sure that the party lives happy. So I don't think it's really a, a CCMA being complicit uh, for it. I think it's really about putting mediation first and also leaving this objectives and spirit of the Labor Relations Act, which is speedy resolution of labor disputes. I don't think there's ever been a commissioner uh, who, who would really be penalized because they have not settled the matter. Of course, it's a, a KPA for commissioners at that time. I don't know the position now. But even if the commissioner do not reach that KPA, there will still be other issues to determine whether the commissioner can be elevated further or be given a renewed contract. But really, it's about a policy decision of mediation first. Thank you, Arnas. Thank you, AJ. Thank you so much, Arnas. And James, James can, can I say something on, 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 this, uh, on this matter? And just to say that we've been joined by another, another stalwart, former stalwart of the, of the CCMA advocate mainly. My view, my view is that uh, I hear and acknowledge what uh, advocate Molozi is saying, but my view is that the, the pressure there's a huge pressure on commissioners to settle their, their cases. And I know this is a fact that during the, during the uh, governing body uh, interviews, this question is always asked. If your settlement rate is below that 70%, there will always be a question as to commissioner, why is your settlement so low? And now, whether this is conscious or unconscious, there's a huge pressure on commissioners to settle as many cases as possible. Now, the issue is not for me, it's not about, it's not about the speedy resolution of a case. The issue is social justice. And this is one of the considerations at some point, the CCMA put together a, a, a commissioner or a mediation commissioner at every region that will look at to the, the quality of the settlement agreements. Because you will find instances where a commissioner settles a case with 200 rents or 100 rents. And, and because the employee at that given time is disparate to take this money, then they take the money and that is regarded as a, as a settlement. I believed and believe that that is wrong. And I believed at, the, at that time, um, uh, SC, I thought that I believed that the settlement rate needs to be pushed low so that you, you concentrate more on the quality of the settlement agreement, far more than what, because it's mere settlement. Because the issue is not just being happy that the, the matter has been settled. The issue is about the quality of the settlement itself. This is an issue that my view is that, for instance, um, bar associations like, uh, like us, South African Bar Association. We need to take up with the, with the with the with the CCMA. It's something that we need to do to say that let's not focus on on because on the fact that the matter is settled. What is the quality of the settlement that you have? Thank you. Thank you so much, Arnas. I agree with you, and thank you so much, Molatsi. I see. Thank you for that. There's a question brought by Makwela. Makwela, you can simply unmute your mic and or your video. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's um, Advocate Mavuela, but I'm also a commissioner, current commissioner. My, um, I wanted to answer on the issue of settlement. Uh, where an employee has settled um, with monetary value or a statutory, statutory monies only. I want to just um, highlight this, that um, we do arbitrate disputes where an employee had settled with monetary value only. We, 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 there's, there's a case law, it's cooked for life. So CCMA has jurisdiction to, to, to arbitrate those disputes because what would be, what would normally, what would an employee normally say to be that I was, I was uh, put under duress to, to settle the dispute. So we look at, at whether he would, you know, the, the employee was put under duress 
and whether indeed the dispute has not been resolved. Because if you're saying that I'm unfairly dismissed, but the settlement uh, that I've signed is only with relations to um, monies that are owed to me, then it's, it doesn't settle the dispute that, this must, that must be before the CCMA. I only wanted to comment on that. So Cook for Life is the case for that you can refer to. Thank you. Can I can I just weigh in on this uh, one? Just uh, yes. two comments. Yes. Uh, one, I think it has to be appreciated sometimes that when we are sitting in the commissioner's seat, it's not a, it's not an easy task. At, at the end. You are confronted with the reality of life. And to this end, I'll say that you will have the parties who will come to you after you have done all the reality testing. One, for example, it might be a possibility that when you look at this, uh, Mr. X, what are you actually looking for? And then when you test the reality in all honesty, assuming that uh, uh, in all fairness, said, no, 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 this guy does not want to pay my 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 pension or my UIF, which is not end. And you ask really that that's all what he wants. Yeah? Uh, and then you might find that this person in actual fact, he came to the wrong forum. He cannot say, no, go to labor. He says, no, I want to labor this guy's travel farm. And so you might find that genuinely that's what you want. And at the second other instance is where you find that in reality, when you do the reality testing, you check with the employee after somehow you do the reality testing, he realizes that he does not have a case. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I've had one one instance where the person actually came to work, was dismissed about two, three times under the influence. I said, but honestly speaking, what do you think? I was with him, the two of us, the other parties out. He said, uh, our commissioner, honestly speaking, I was just taking a chance, man. Let them just give me my UIF, I'll go, <laughs> you know? So in those uh, cases, let's not be very harsh to the commissioners. Uh, the question of uh, bullying, maybe let me just uh, leave it. It might be some other some other topics, but there might be the reality which faces the commissioner. Uh, in all fairness, you might you might well think that maybe it's unfair, like the instance that I just uh, told you. Maybe the other ones I wanted to comment. I think that my my colleagues have handled them. That's thank you. Ralph, there are many questions. Unfortunately, time does not permit for such. And regrettably, I have now closed the question and answer session. What remains is to yet sincerely again thank Arnaus for his eliminating address and naturally for his time. Appreciation to all those that have participated and all those that have commented, including the various commissioners and, and Advocate Molotzi SC. Appreciation to those that have participated virtually and shall be watching the session at their, le at their leisure. These sessions are recorded and the recordings can be found upon the South African Bar Association website, that being www.rsabar.net. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Cheers.